He's a professor of great eminence, and he joins us now on the mother of all talk shows. Professor Norman, thanks uh, for being with us. I have resisted uh, for decades, actually, uh, sometimes under instruction from my superiors, uh, allusions uh, between Gaza and the Warsaw Ghetto, between Gaza and the camps and so on. But hasn't Gaza now become a death camp? I think that's an accurate description. I think from 2006 or earlier, it was uh, technically accurate to describe Gaza as a concentration camp. Uh, already in 2003, the respected Hebrew University professor Baruch Kimmerling described Gaza as, quote, the largest concentration camp ever. Uh, Giora Island, who's a senior official in Israeli in the Israeli government and Israeli elite circles, Giora uh, Island described Gaza as quote a huge concentration camp. And now that was before, in the case of Professor Kimmerling, and the case of Island. That was before the blockade had been ratcheted up in 2006 and then ratcheted up another notch in 2007. So already before the brutal blockade of Gaza, which Richard Goldstone himself in the Goldstone report after Operation Cast Lead, he said it likely rose to a, quote, crime against humanity. So well before the developments I just described, the um, a senior Israeli professor, a senior Israeli official, uh, was describing Gaza as a concentration camp. However, I do think it's correct to say at this point, it's no longer only, if we can use that qualification, it's not only a concentration camp, but it's become a death camp. Now, for those of those of your listeners who recoil at that description, I would ask them to respond to the following question. On October 8th, three of Israel's senior officials stated the following. Number one, Chaim Herzog, the president of Israel, stated that Israel would not distinguish between Hamas and civilians. He said they voted for Hamas, meaning the civilians. They didn't overthrow Hamas, and therefore they bear the same responsibility for the events of October 7th as Hamas itself. Statement number two was by the Israeli Defense Minister Gallant. He said, henceforth, we're not going to allow any food, water, fuel, or electricity into Gaza. And statement number three was by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who said that this was going to probably be the longest, as they call it, operation that Israel has had to conduct. Now, Operation Protective Edge in 2014, it lasted 51 days. So let's add up the three statements. Number one, we're not distinguishing between civilians and combatants. Number two, we're not allowing any food, water, electricity, or fuel into Gaza for combatants and for the 2.3 million civilians, of whom half are children. And number three, we expect that this operation will go on for a minimum 51 plus days. So if you add up those three statements and you connect the dots, I would ask you listeners to respond to the question, how can that not be described as a genocide? How can that not be described as a murder warrant for the 2.3 million people in Gaza, of whom half are children 
and about 70% are refugees from the 1948 war and their descendants. Now, it is true around the edges, around the narrowest of margins, the U.S. has put some pressure on Biden, basically, excuse me, some pressure on the Israeli government by Biden uh, and Lincoln, so as I, so as it doesn't look so horrible on the television screen, the computer screen. But that the impact of those uh, uh, those marginal efforts are so insignificant that I don't think they need at this point. At this point, they need to be factored in or in any way dilute the fact that what's going on now in Gaza is a genocide. The uh, the fighting or the killing uh, rather stepped up rather than decreased after Blinken's visit. One were, was told in the briefings that he was going to ask for a pause for uh, a brief ceasefire and so on, but actually this very evening it's the heaviest bombardment of the war. We saw the ludicrous story today uh, in the New York Times, I think, uh, that Biden had asked Netanyahu to use smaller bombs. Uh, I agree with you that at the margin, a small bomb is marginally better than a big one, will kill marginally fewer, if you're lucky, uh, than a big bomb uh, will. But why is Netanyahu treating uh, Blinken and, by extension, Biden with such disdain? There are several points you made which require a response. Number one, there is this kind of terminology that has entered into the uh, current round of murder, high-tech murder. Uh, the first terminological addition has been this expression of humanitarian pause. It's very hard to make sense of exactly what the humanitarian pause means. It seems to mean that you're going to allow 15 minutes to let the, to fatten up the turkey before you kill it. A humanitarian pause is something along the lines of giving a prisoner scheduled next morning for the electric chair, giving them a last meal. What is the point of a humanitarian pause of 15 minutes of a half hour if the bombing is going to directly resume and just murder the people who a moment ago benefited from a glass of water or a cheese sandwich. The issue is not a humanitarian pause. The issue is a ceasefire. And we shouldn't allow ourselves to be distracted by this idiotic terminology. The demand has been by the international community and its various constituents for a ceasefire. Number two is talk about a big bomb versus a little bomb. The whole thing at some level is completely insane because of aspects of international law that are insane. So let's take the example of Jabalia. Israel has been dropping, as it did in Shujaya during Operation Protective Edge, Israel has been dropping 2,000 pound bombs in, in uh, Jabalia refugee camp. Jabalia refugee camp is among the densest populated refugee camps in among the densely populated, most densely populated places, places on earth. Okay. And Israel's pretexts are number one, it always, it always finds a Hamas militant, usually a Hamas militant leader, or the tunnels that they're, they claim to be targeting. Now, under international law, there are three basic principles. There's the principle of distinction, there's the principle of discrimination, and there's the principle of disproportionality. 
I'm using the D for each of them so your listeners can follow. The principle of distinction, every one of your listeners knows. It simply means you're not allowed to target civilians or civilian sites, hospitals, schools, homes. You can only target military uh, combatants or military sites. That's the most basic principle of international law. The second principle is the principle of discrimination. Discrimination simply means you can't use a weapon that cannot discriminate between civilians and combatants. Let's say poison gas. Poison gas just spreads, can't contain its spread, can't dis distinguish between civilians and combatants. Therefore, it's illegal under international law. And then there's this third principle called disproportionality or proportionality. I use disproportionality because of the D, the alliterative aspect. What does disproportionality mean? It simply means if, you, uh, if you're targeting a legitimate military site, the, I hate these expressions, but I have to use them. The collateral damage to civilians has to be proportional to the value of the military target. So if you're going to target two combatants who happen to be lodged in a civilian home, and there are five civilians in that home, you have to make the judgment, is the value of your target, two combatants, sufficiently great as to justify killing three civilians. That's the principle of proportionality. The value of the military target has to be proportional to the collateral damage to civilians. Okay, but now you're dropping 2,000 pound bombs in the middle of a densely populated refugee camp. How could any principle of proportionality possibly justify that. Killing one Hamas militant and in the process killing 200 civilians in Jabalia, I think the figure was 195. And yet, when you open up the newspapers or you listen to the pundits, they bring on all of these learned experts in what's called IHL, International Humanitarian Law, or the Laws of War, who say this is a very difficult question of proportionality. And when I listen to that, it shows you how rotten, how insane this whole idea of the laws of war are. If people can honestly believe dropping two thousand pound bombs in refugee camps is a complicated legal question. To me, that is straight out insane. And I would add, if you were to go to any of my classes, because I teach the laws of war, international humanitarian law, and if you asked anyone in the class According to the terms of proportionality, which is a very vague term, can killing 200 civilians in a refugee camp be justified by the fact that you want to hit a tunnel or a Hamas militant? I could say with certainty that of a class of 40, you couldn't find more than one student who would defend such insanity. You could not find it, because we've discussed it in my class many times, these hypotheticals. And yet, when you get out of a class which has a normal sense of right and wrong, and then you turn to these so-called experts. You just want to wretch. You want to wretch when you hear these kinds of expert deliberations. 
on whether or not, the other day, two days ago, there was an article in The Guardian, and it was the question of Jabalia. And at the very end, of, you, your listeners can find it, it was just two days ago. At the very end of the article, they have a woman expert in international humanitarian law. And she says, yes, this is a tough question. No, it's not a tough question. You're a moral idiot. There's nothing tough about that question. You're a moral idiot if you think that's a tough question. Now, let me turn now to the third question, the third aspect of the question you asked. And the question with Blinken and uh, Biden and why they aren't putting more pressure on Israel. First of all, let's stop with the silliness. Israel suffered a huge blow on October 7th in terms of its vaunted security services, its commandos, you know, the raid on Entebbe and all the claims made about Israel's brilliant uh, um, intelligence system, it was a disaster. It's not, it was a lot more than a sleep at the switch, you know? So that's number one. Number two, Biden immediately gave them $14 billion. Number three, there were aircraft carriers sent by the United States. Don't tell me, don't tell me, Biden and Blinken were unable to say to the Prime Minister of Israel, listen, buddy, you just effed up royally on October 7th. We're pulling your chestnuts from the fire. We're holding up any action in the United Nations. Don't tell me that you're not going to allow for a humanitarian pause. If the United States wanted to put its foot down with Israel, it could put its foot down with Israel. It chooses not to. And for each side, it's a game. For Netanyahu, it gets to show he, how strong he is. You remember that interview on October 9th, roughly, with Naftali Bennett, uh, with the British broadcaster, where he says, we're lions, we're lions, we're lions. So Netanyahu gets to play that role. You know, we told the United States no. And the United States gets to play the role of the pig with white gloves. Gets to say, you see, we tried. We did our best. No, you didn't do your best. It's all theatrics. It's all show. And it's the same thing with using smaller bombs. It doesn't look good. It's not a good optic. If you go to YouTube, you'll get images of what a 2,000 bomb, 2,000 pound bomb looks like. And I posted in my website today. And that's not a good picture. It's not a good, as they like to say, I hate all these expressions, but I'll use them. It's not a good optic. When you take, you superimpose all the smoke and flames from that 2,000 pound bomb, and in your mind, you superimpose it on a densely populated refugee camp, half of which consists of children, not a good optic. So Biden opens up the Times, and the Times says Israel dropped two 2,000 pound bombs on Jabalia, and he says no doesn't look good. So he says to Israel, use smaller bombs. Oh, like let's use... Um... Unbelievable. Now, uh, speaking of bombs, uh, you and I and many uh, people close to the subject have known ever since the brave uh, whistleblower Mordechai Vanunu still uh, held uh, today, uh, decades later, uh, having been in solitary confinement for 20 years or so. We know from him uh, in London, he blew the whistle, uh, that Israel was in possession of the nuclear bomb. But Israel has always denied this, and nobody in the international system has ever asked to inspect their nuclear weapons facility. No one's ever asked them to sign the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty. No one's ever asked them to be visited by the IAEA, all the things that they have done to others, Iraq, Iran, and others. Um, but today, uh, the former information minister gave us 
some pretty big information, didn't he? He gave the public, anyway, some pretty big information. He admitted on TV uh, that Israel dropping a nuclear bomb on Gaza was one of the options on the table. How do you think that's going to play? First of all, I don't think they can do that because of the blowback. It's not as if Gaza is out on a desert island. I do think, now I want to preface what I'm about to say, uh, I have no knowledge of military affairs, and I say it with no shame, military affairs has never been my cup of tea, and I'm not going to pretend to be a, uh, a Rommel or a Montgomery, uh, that's not me. On the other hand, as a rational matter, it doesn't seem to me possible that Israel can fight a war on two fronts. Actually, barely Israel can barely fight a war on one front. In 2006, when Israel in, uh, went to war in Lebanon, uh, the war lasted 34 days, sometimes called the Lebanon War II. Uh, the head of the Hezbollah, Nasrallah, called it the divine victory. Uh, uh, whatever you call it, uh, Israel brought, my memory is it brought 30,000 troops to the Lebanese front, but it did not want to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the party of God. And there I think uh, Nas uh, Syed Nasrallah in his speech, uh, not trying to be demagogic about it, uh, but I think he was correct. He said the Israeli army is only capable of committing massacres. It's not a, it's no longer a fighting force. And that's why it held off so long in Gaza. It was, let me get back to Lebanon. In Lebanon in 2006, it didn't, inv it didn't invade Lebanon on the ground, a ground invasion. It didn't do it until the last 72 hours. And at that point, the Israelis were desperate because they didn't want to send a ground force into uh, uh, Lebanon. You don't want to tangle with the party of God. That's not a smart move. So they already asked Condoleezza Rice, who was the um, uh, Secretary of State at the time, they asked her to get an, in a uh, UN resolution for a ceasefire. Because if you had a choice between a ceasefire and the party of God, if you have any prudence, you choose a ceasefire. And then when the war was already over, Israel sent its troops into Lebanon. They flew across the terrain to the Latani River for a photo op to show that we invaded Lebanon. And the Hezbollah's reaction was, in the last day of the war, it fired 10,000, my memory is, my memory is pretty good on this, fired 10,000 rockets, the largest number uh, in those 34 days, to transmit the message to Israel, you didn't win, you know. In the case of the uh, current situation, Israel waited about three weeks to just pulverize the place the kingdom come before it's willing to send in its ground forces. How far it's sent them in, I don't know. How significant the Hamas resistance will be, I don't know. I don't think one should uh, have too high expectations from Hamas. Um, in terms of its ability, once that place has been pulverized, uh, to carry out a significant resistance. Uh, the other fact is the, the uh, strategy of the uh, Israeli army, or at least one of the strategies that's been discussed, is to seal off the northern sector, to bomb the area connecting the northern sector to the southern sector, the border, the, the provisional border between the northern sector and the southern sector, and thereby seal, seal off all the tunnels, and then leave the militants who are in the tunnels, leave them there to begin to suffocate or starve, and then force them out. I Again, I don't know anything about military affairs, but that seems like a plausible strategy, and there's no way that, speaking as a non-military person, uh, there seems to be no way that uh, Hamas will be able to counter that. 
Uh, the only possibility is, uh, which now seems to be a slim possibility, that the party of, uh, that the Hezbollah will enter in a significant way uh, if it seems like the cause is going to go down to utter and total defeat. Uh, we don't know. I think that Nasrallah's speech, I wrote to my friends, comrades, uh, I said, I'm hoping for a miracle. Well, it wasn't a miracle, and that just gives further proof that miracles don't happen in this world. Uh, he was an impossible, uh, Hezbollah is an impossible situation, because if they do something, Lebanon is going to be leveled, mm -hmm. and the people will turn against Hezbollah. Uh, and also, it's unlikely that Iran wants a broader war now, because just on the eve of the war, they had that deal between the $6 billion and releasing the hostages, which no doubt in Iran's mind was going to pave the way to some sort of uh, rapprochement, not a significant one, but some sort of rapprochement with the United States. So they don't want a broader war either. It's a very tough situation now. Uh, However, one thing I would say is, going back to your original question, uh, Israel cannot fight a two-front war. Now, it can't use nuclear weapons in Lebanon because of the blowback. You know, the atmosphere will be, anyone who knows anything about nuclear weapons, the atmosphere will be completely con contaminated. Uh, whether it can use, there is, I've read, because as I said, I teach the laws of war, there is some discussion about the capacity of what are called tactical or limited nuclear weapons to contain the blowback, the um, radiation, contamination, and so forth. If such weapons exist, uh, there is a possibility they'll, they'll use it in Iran. Uh, and of course, that should be cause for significant, <laughs> to say the least, significant concern. Um, but that all was premised on uh, the Hezbollah opening up a second front, which Trias Nisrallah did to claim it had. You will recall he said that a quarter of the Israeli Air Force is now directed to the north, that half the troops are stationed in the north, and he did everything he can to convey that he's doing something. But I talked to many people afterwards, and they were very disappointed in this Rallah speech, even though realistically, he didn't really have many options. He didn't really have any more options. So it's a, it's a very tough, it's a tough situation. Uh, on the other tough, hand- Tough, tough, tough situation indeed. Professor, uh, I told everyone about the Amazon number one uh, bestseller that you've got now. Uh, just remind me of the title and uh, anywhere else that they can get it, because some people don't like to deal with Amazon, uh, because it's very, very important that people read your book. Okay, the title of the book is Gaza, an Inquest into its Martyrdom, and it's published by University of California Press. I don't think any bookstores <laughs> carry it, unsurprisingly, uh, but people can use their creativity and figure out options other than Amazon. I'm not aware of them because I I just publish books and then move on. I don't know anything about the mechanics. Well, more power to your elbow. Professor Norman Finkelstein, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows.